What's that? 109. <laughs> 109 be our song of encouragement. Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 6. In a discussion of, really a discussion of, begun as a discussion of divorce, which was turned around into a discussion of marriage, Jesus went all the way back to the Garden of Eden and how God had created man and woman uh, in the garden. And he used or quoted the words that Adam spoke as recorded in Genesis 2 and about verse number 23 and following. and said, they are no longer two but one flesh. And then he added these words to those that were found in Genesis 2. What God has joined together, let not man separate. King James, we know, most of us know it better from the, from the old King James. Let not man put asunder means to, to separate. Now, if you, saw, if you saw the post this morning, said our subject this morning is what God joined together, not a lesson on marriage. We're going to look at seven things that God has joined together outside of a man and woman in the bonds of matrimony. So this would be kind of a, kind of a, a subject or a theme of a sermon. So we're going to look at seven things that God has joined together. And the first is that the Father and the Son have been joined together. In John 10 and verse number 30, the Bible says, I and my Father are one. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Bible teaches us from, from the days of old, says, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And yet from Genesis 1, we know that God exists in a plurality of, of persons, so to speak. That there is the Father, and of course before Jesus became Jesus, it was the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And then that Word became flesh, and then He became Jesus, the Son. But He was not the Son uh, before, only the Son in purpose. In John chapter 17 and beginning in verse number 11, as Jesus prayed on the night in which he was betrayed, he said regarding his apostles, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And then in verse 20, neither do I pray for these alone, but also for all who will believe on me through their word, that they may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And so we, we see that there has been a joining together of the Father and the Son, and that that joining was recognized by Jesus even in the earliest days of his uh, public ministry. And I think there's an e even the allusion to that, that's the A-L-L -L allusion, not I-L-L -L allusion, the A-L-L, -L, uh, the allusion to that in Luke 2 when Jesus spoke about the need to be about his father's business. In other words, there was the recognition, there was the recognition of, the, uh, of him being united with the heavenly father. So number one, God has joined together the Father and the Son. But then number two, God has joined together the Spirit and the Word. The Spirit and the Word. In 2 Samuel 23 and verse 2, David said this, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His Word was in my tongue. Isn't that interesting? David attributed the words that he was speaking directly to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. God said this to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, 8, 9. He said, I have put my word in your 
mouth. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 21, the Bible says, For prophecy did not come in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so, again, the words of the prophets, the words of the Old Testament writers, and even, uh, I think Peter would, would have included the New, certainly would have included the New Testament writers, including himself, as one who was writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Here's a verse I hadn't really thought of a lot in that regard, but in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, and goes on to, to, to enumerate a number of departures from the faith. But did you note know the opening line? Paul's like, I'm not telling you this. The Holy Spirit is telling you this. But how was Paul telling it? Through the written word. In other words, I'm writing this down, but it's the words of the Holy Spirit that I am writing down for you to, to hear and to heed. Um, let us look at some passages together here where Jesus spoke uh, to this matter. Open your Bibles to John chapter 14. And we're going to go John 14, John 15, John 16. Okay? Now again, this is, uh, this is following what we call the Last Supper in John 13. It's the, <coughs> it's the evening in which Jesus was going to be betrayed. It, but, you know, the, the, the night before his, basically the night before his death. And he says in John 14, 25, he says, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, in other words, he identifies the helper. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So, in other words, Jesus was promising to his apostles that they would receive direct instruction from the Holy Spirit. Now, John 15 and verse number 26. But when the Helper comes, now we're, we're still talking about that same Holy Spirit from John 14, 26. When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So again, Jesus says the Helper is the Spirit of truth. And he's going to give you instructions. And you're going to relay to others what he has given to you. In other words, the Spirit has been joined to the Word. One more from this particular context. John 16, beginning in verse 12. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And all things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. One more, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And beginning in verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared has prepared for those who love him. In other words, these things have not been original with man. But look at verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. 
For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man that is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. See, see what Paul says there? We've been given the Spirit of God so that we can know the things of God. Then verse 14, or verse 13. These things we also speak. What things? The things revealed by the Spirit. These are the things he says that we are speaking. The things given to us by the Spirit of God. Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And so Paul here is very clear that his teaching and the teaching that, that he's been doing has been given to him by the Spirit of God. Now, is Paul still teaching us today? Is Paul still teaching us today? He sure is, through the, through the, through the books that he wrote. Is, are John and Luke and Peter, Matthew, Mark, you know, James, are, Jude, are, are these men still teaching us today? They are. How? Through the words that they recorded. Now, where did they get those words? From the Holy Spirit. And so we learn that the instruction that we receive through the Bible comes to us from God the Father, from Christ the Son, and from the Holy Spirit. And that the work of the Spirit is still going on today. Uh, I think in about a week or two, maybe three I wrote uh, or copied an article I had written from John 16 called, I Believe in the Present Work of the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit is still working today. But how is that Spirit working today? Well, He's working through this Word. Now, some people will attempt to separate the Spirit from this Word. And that's why I mentioned this specifically. When people say that the Spirit has to operate directly on the heart of the sinner in order for him to believe, which is a fundamental tenet of what? Calvinism. It takes the word, it takes the word completely out of the equation. People don't understand that the Spirit is still working, but He's working through the medium of the word. And I meant to do this, and I forgot last night, uh, you know, a great illustration I heard one time, and I've used it a number of times through the years, is, is I was going to bring you, I was going to bring a golf club and a golf ball, and just just hold it right here, and say, now, if if I told you I hit that ball, I hit a golf ball, we would all understand what I used the club to hit the ball, right? I mean, and by the way, I don't even have to explain that, right? You know, it, it, you know, if Furman comes up here and says, I hit the ball, I hit the ball on number seven within three feet of the stick. I understand he took a club and hit the ball, and, and that he moved the ball with the club. Well, that's how the Spirit works with men today. The Spirit is holding the stick, the stick is the Word of God, and the ball is the heart of man. And so if the heart of man's going to be moved, it's only going to be moved by the club. And the only person who wields the club is the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Now I know I know that no illustration is perfect, but it gives us it gives us some idea of how the Spirit works on the hearts of men today. God has joined the Spirit and the word. But then number three, God has joined the words of Christ. And by the way, this kind of this is kind of a segue. Uh, 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 this is kind of a natural outgrowth of the previous. That God has joined the words of Christ and the words of the apostles. In the prayer of Jesus in John 17, we've just read some of that. Back in verse 8, Jesus made this statement. I have given them the words 
you have given me. And they have received them. Jesus said, I got the words from my Father, and I gave them to the apostles, and the apostles have received them. In other words, they have, they have accepted them as true and valid. In 1 Corinthians 14, and verse number 37, Paul says, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of God. What was Paul doing? He was writing. He was writing words. And he says, the words that I'm writing to you right now are actually the commandments of God. The words of Christ and the words of the apostles have been joined together. Paul said the same in Galatians 1 and verse 11 and 12. He said, the gospel that I preached unto you was not according to man, neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. Lord Paul said, the things I'm teaching you are the things that Jesus told me to teach. The words of Christ and the words of the apostles have been joined together. But then number four, grace and faith have been joined together. Grace and faith. For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, and God has uh, before ordained that we should walk in them. Grace and faith have been joined together. In other words, it's not just grace, and it's not just faith. Not long after I moved to Paris, Tennessee, uh, we had a local paper, the Post Intelligencer. And there was an article in the local paper one time where the, uh, the local Lutheran preacher was a little, he got a little bit sideways little bit offended. Now, I thought it was kind of trivial, but what it was was, and our paper has it too. Like the when we used to get it twice a week, you know, the Saturday edition always said what? Worship at the church of your choice, right? And then there, in that paper there was what? A kind of a directory of all the churches in the county, right? And they were divided. How were they divided? Well, all by denomination. Yeah, divided by, by denomination, right. Or, or, or divided by, by kind, we'll say, because because our people were in there, so we don't want to say that denomination. But divided by kind. Well, the PI had theirs, and it, it had theirs divided in kind, except for the fact there was only one Lutheran church within about 50 miles. So rather than having a, a Lutheran heading, it just took all of them that, what, that was kind of solos and stuck them under in the other. <laughs> other. And he got offended. He was in the other category. So then he thought, well, since people don't know too much about us, he said, I'm going to write, he wrote an article in the paper trying to introduce the Lutheran church to the community, which I thought, you know, on his part, was a good idea. I mean, if I, if I was him, I'd want to do the same thing. But here's what he said. Talking a little bit about Lutheran beliefs. And by the way, I'm pretty sure I've got that article in my desk in that old office back there. It says this. We believe that man is saved by grace only through faith only. We believe that man is saved by grace only through faith only. Does anybody see the problem with that? There's too many onlys in there. If anything's only, it's only. It's only, that's right, Walter, just one. You can't have one only and another only combined to create only. Now, what he should have said was we believe in salvation by grace through faith. But he said by grace only through faith only. 
which is a contradiction. But make no mistake, God has joined grace and faith. Ephesians 2, 8 is clear. For example, look at Romans chapter 5. Look at Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, or through our Lord Jesus, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. See how Paul joined grace and faith there? It says, through our faith, we have access to what? Grace. Now, for example, in Titus chapter 2, it says, Now the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. But we know that all men are not participants in the grace of God, right? They're all the recipients of the grace of God, but they're not all participants in the grace of God. And what is, what is the one thing that keeps men from being a participant in the grace of God? Faith. The one thing that keeps a man from being a participant in the grace of God is faith. And faith comes by <coughs> hearing the word of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17. One more example which will also segue into number 5. In Genesis 6 and verse 8, the Bible says, Noah found what? Grace. Grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Hebrews 11, not but, and I should say, and Hebrews 11 and verse 7 says, by faith Noah, being warned of things not yet seen, prepared an ark to the saving of his household. Now think about this. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How was that grace manifested to Noah? By being warned of things not yet seen. That was the manifestation of God's grace in Noah's life. When he warned him of things not yet seen and then instructed him on how to avoid the cataclysmic event that was about to take place. So then how did Noah become a participant in the grace of God? Through his faith. Which brings us to number five. That God has joined faith and works. Noah became a participant in the grace of God when his faith moved him to works. Turn with me, if you would, to James 2 and verse 24. Actually, it's verse 14. I want to read through verse 24. James 2, 14 to 24. God has joined faith. He's joined grace and faith, and he's joined faith and works, which means what? He's joined works to what? grace. If these two things are joined together and this thing is joined to another thing, then what? They're all three joined, aren't they? James 2 beginning verse 14. For what is a prophet, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is no, it can't. If his faith doesn't have works, his faith can't save him. If a brother or sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you says, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does that profit? Thus also, in other words, in like fashion, if faith is by itself, without works, it is dead. Verse 18. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But will you know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead. 
God has joined faith and works. The whole chapter of Hebrews 11 is a chapter showing the joining of faith and works. Hebrews 11, 4. By faith, Abel offered an acceptable sacrifice. That's what it says. By faith, Abel offered an acceptable sacrifice. By faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 7, as we've already noted, by faith, Noah built an ark. Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed God. See how that works? Abel offered, Noah built, Abraham obeyed. And the list goes on and on and on throughout the course of that magnificent chapter. Some about 40 verses. God has joined faith and works. Number six, God has joined obedience and the forgiveness of sins. God has joined obedience to the forgiveness of sins. By the way, you can substitute the word works for the word obedience. You can join the you can substitute the word works for obedience because that's the types of works that we're talking about. Not works of man's device, works of obedience where man obeys God. And he in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, seeing then you have purified your souls by obeying the truth. Through the Spirit unto unfeigned love for the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. How was, how was the soul purified? By obeying the truth. Hebrews 5 and verse 8, though he were a son, speaking of Jesus, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to who? All them that obey him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. In Romans 6, open your Bibles there. I know we're running a little long on time, but I want you to see this. In Romans chapter 6, and look at verse 17 and verse 18. But God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Having then been made free from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. The word then there is not in the New King James, it's in the King James, but the word is there. It's just a little old, little old Greek word, which is, uh, the, if you were to spell it out, it would be the letters D-E, de. It's a word that, in this case, means a continuation of a line of thinking or an order of events. What kind of order of events do we find here in Romans 6 and verse 17? By the way, you can write this, you can write this in, a, in order down at the bottom. Number one, slave of sin. Number two, obeyed the doctrine. Number three, then made free from sin. Number four, became a servant of righteousness. That's the order. Slave of sin, obeyed from the heart, then made free from sin. Actually, the text should read, would, could read this. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Then, being made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. See how important that word then is? When is a man made free from sin? When he obeys the doctrine. But what doctrine? Well, Romans 6, 3 through 7 answers that for us. Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. There's the form. Baptism is the form. Romans 6, 3 through 5. 
It's the form that must be obeyed in order to be made free from sin, Romans 6, 17 and 18. God has joined obedience to the forgiveness of sins. Lastly, this. God has joined salvation to the church. God has joined salvation to the church. In 1 Corinthians 15, 23 and 24, the Bible says when Jesus comes back, he's going to deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. And even a casual reading of Matthew 16, Matt, uh, verses 16 to 19, Matthew 18, verses 18 and 19, Colossians 1 and verse 13, Acts uh, 14, 22, over and over again, Revelation 1 and verse 9, we know that the kingdom is the church. And if Jesus is going to deliver up the kingdom when he comes back, he's going to deliver up the church. And Ephesians 5 and verse 23 says he's the Savior of the body. And Ephesians 1, 22, 23, Colossians 1 and verse 18 says the body is the church. And in Acts 2 and verse 47, the Lord adds the saved to somebody or something. It's the church. God has joined salvation to the church. You can put all this together. If grace is joined, if grace is joined to faith, and faith is joined to works, obedience. And obedience is joined to the remission of sins. And remission of sins is joined to the church. And the church is joined to being saved. They're all joined together, aren't they? It's not just one. They're all joined together. Who joined them? God did. This is not some doctrine of man, some, some man-made idea that's been conjured up. It's what the Bible teaches. It teaches that God has joined these things together. The Bible teaches us also that when we obey the gospel, we're joined to Christ. The of us have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. We become the bride of Christ, joined as if in marriage. If you're here this morning, you need to be joined to Christ. Become participant in the grace of God. Through your faith, render obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ today.